Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories. We have stories that should thrill you a little and chill you a little. It's amazing. What you'll hear are adventures sent in by you guys, classic stories from the pulp mags, and episodes from the golden age of radio. We have special segments like Ghost Stories with Sylvia. That's amazing. And these are your stories. So settle in for the next hour and enjoy the show. One more thing. You just might want to prepare yourself to be taken away from today. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by the word idiom. Oh, here we go. Another bad joke. Nope. An idiom is a group of words established by the usage as having a meaning not deductible from those of the individual words. Easy does it. Exactly. Well, how does Dream Girl look today, Willie? She's still a best horse in this fight, Mr. Hillary. How long have you been handling her, Willie? Ever since you bought her, don't you remember? I'm paying you a great deal of money to train these horses of mine. When do they start paying off? Well, you can't expect a winner in every race, Mr. Hillary. I'm familiar with the law of averages. That's why I've asked my question. If you don't like the way I've been taking care of your stable, you can get yourself another trainer. Not so fast. We have a contract. You're a liar. Break it. No. You've been a trainer for 20 years. You've been with my stable for two. And in that period of time, you've made your worst record. What I'm trying to do is figure out why. Where's the answer? You don't buy your horses right. I got bad horses to work with. Dream girl's your best one. Ah, see? He agrees with me. Yeah, very touching. But since you can't accept a subtle hint, suppose I come to the heart of what I'm talking about. What do you mean? Simply, Willie, that you've been doctoring up my horses. I've got proof, and I'm going to see you put away for more years than you've been racing. Oh, no, you're not. Put down that shoe, you fool. Sure, I'll put it down. Oh! How long, Hillary? The race is over. When did you find the body here in the stable, Willie? Right before the first race. I was coming to look over Dream Girl before she was posted. Where was the body lying? There, by the door. There's a pile of straw almost covering it. Why do you suppose Dream Girl attacked Mr. Hillary? I don't know. I've always noticed she got sort of restless whenever he'd come in the stable. Yeah. Look at the marks on Hillary's skull, Willie. Notice the imprint of the heels on his chin and cheeks? And the mark at the top of the shoe on his forehead? Oh, she really must have struck out on him. Where's the horse now? In the next stall. Yeah. Mind if I look at her? Ah, oh, go right ahead. She's in here. Yeah. Hello, girl. Hey. There's blood all over her right hind hoof. Yeah, I've seen it there before, but I left it alone for you to look at. How long did you wait to call me after you discovered Hillary's body, Willie? Oh, I dashed to the nearest phone. I didn't waste a minute. Yeah. Where'd you find the horse? In the next stall with the body. And you've nothing else to tell me? Of course not. What else could that be? A confession, Willie, as to how you murdered Hillary. How does the inspector know that Willie, Dream Girl's trainer, killed his employer? In just a moment, we'll know, but first... Well, it's not really a mystery when they give us a blow-by-blow of who done it. I have to agree. Also, the how was pretty evident as well. Yep, you whacked him with a horseshoe. So what is left to say? Well, a horse walks into a bar. The barman confuses idioms with jokes and offers him a glass of water, but he can't make him drink. (laughs) Dang, Ron, that was a real sophisticated joke. I thought you might like it. I wouldn't go that far. And now, back to our story. And you crazy inspector, you can see for yourself that dream girl killed Hillary. Look at the imprint of the horseshoe on his head. I did look at the imprint, Willie. That's all I need to send you to the chair. The man who spent his life around horses, Willie. You should have known better. A horse always kicks up with its hind hoof, Willie, not down. Therefore, if dream girl had attacked Hillary, the imprint of her heels would have been embedded in the forehead and not in his chin. I'm sure I I mean... uh... It's all right, Willie. I know what you mean. 
You killed Hillary with one of Dream Girl's shoes. Perhaps this will teach you a lesson, will he? Never try to pin a murder rap on a horse. That has to be one of the dumbest idioms I've ever heard. Wrong. That was not an idiom. It was more of an idiocy. I'm not familiar. Really? I thought you would be the expert on them, seeing how you are a proclaimed idiot. BG, I don't think I like you. I'm glad you got that out of your system. Oh, hey, that's an idiom. Yes, it is. Hello, and welcome to the podcast. Today, we have a treat. Sylvia Schultz is here, and she's going to share a story, help us review an audiobook that she wrote, and tell us about her newest book, Gone on Vacation, Haunted Zoos, Museums, and Amusement Parks. Also, we have a listener story from Germany that is, well, nothing short of amazing. Then we will end the show with a very creepy story from the OTR series, Inner Sanctum. It is titled, The Listener. A woman faces the ghost of her dead husband. So, now that you know what's in store, what do you say we get to it? Today's podcast is brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to? Fractured Spirits, Haunting at the Peoria State Hospital, narrated by Leanne Howlett. Now, you might be wondering why I didn't tell you who authored this. Well, that's because the book was written by our very own Sylvia Schultz. This is her third book that has been turned into an audiobook, and it just might be the best. During the first half of the 20th century, the Peoria State Hospital was the premier mental health facility of its day. Dr. George Zeller created a model for the care of the mentally ill. Today, there are only a few buildings left at the hospital. Some of them are still in use. Others are inhabited only by ghosts. Our guide to these ghosts and the history that they represent is... Sylvia Schultz. Sylvia, what can you tell us about this book? Well, Ron, I was really excited to write this book. It came about because I got curious. I was hearing stories about this abandoned mental asylum, so I started investigating it and started collecting people's ghost stories about it. But the neat thing about this hospital is that the history and the compassion with which these patients were treated is just as fascinating as the ghost stories. So learning about the legacy of care that came out of this hospital for the treatment of the mentally ill was just as special to me as hearing all those wonderful ghost stories. How cool is it that three of your books have been made into Audible books? Oh, I am so very grateful for this. Just I listen to a lot of books on CD when I'm driving places, and they just make the hours fly and make the miles pass like nothing. So it's a real treat to have somebody reading a book to you. I grew up with my father reading to uh, us kids, too. So I'm just so very grateful that my books are being read to people in this way. I guess my last question uh, about this is... What can we expect from this book? Is it all just history? Or what is the quintessential thing that we should take away from Fractured Spirits? 
The quintessential thing you need to remember is that this was a place like no other. The ghosts are fascinating, yes, and the reason they are still there is because they received such excellent care. They want to spend their afterlife there. This was a place of compassion, and that is what I really wanted to make people realize. This isn't a scary place. This isn't a place where the patients were abused and resulted in hauntings because of that. This resulted in hauntings because of the family nature of the Peoria State Hospital. Well, Sylvia, we have a clip from the book and it comes from the chapter titled The Pollock Hospital. Now we've talked about that one many times. It tells the story of your friend David and his encounter with a spirit. But before I play this clip, you say that David is a sensitive in this story. And me personally, I'm not 100% sure what that means. Can you give us a quick definition? Of course. There are sensitives and then there are psychic mediums and the two is sort of the person's own interpretation of what they experience. A sensitive will be aware of different energies, the energies of people that have passed on, because that's all a ghost is really, is life energy le left over. And a medium is someone who can pick up on that energy enough to be able to communicate with the spirit of the person that has passed on. We have mediums that are clairvoyant, they can see dead people, they clairaudient, they can hear them, clairsentient, they can understand what they're saying just in their minds. A sensitive usually won't claim that much of a connection. A sensitive will be aware of that energy, but they may not be able to communicate as well as a psychic medium. All right, well, let's play the clip. When Dark Continents Publishing launched the first baker's dozen of books in its product line, the president of the company decided to do some good. I've known David M. Youngquist for several years, and he loves the written word with a clear, undeniable passion. At his suggestion, the company decided to donate one copy of each book in its catalog to two area libraries. One, up in David's neck of the woods, was the tiny Sheffield Library. Dark Continent's donation of 13 books covered three-quarters of their book purchasing for the year. The other library chosen to receive a full complement of books was the library I work for, Fond du Lac District Library in East Peoria. Our director was thrilled with the donation and called the local paper in to take pictures. David drove down from Princeton with a back seat full of books. Since it was a drive of an hour and a half for him, he asked me to suggest other area libraries for him to visit that morning. The plan was for David to make Fond du Lac his first stop, donate the books, then visit a few more libraries. Then he'd drive back to East Peoria, meet me for lunch, then drive home. I gave him detailed directions, sending him from East Peoria to Pekin, then across the river to Alpha Park Library in Bartonville. Now, David's a sensitive... As I handed him the sheet of directions, I said, Okay, now after you cross the river and go north into Bartonville, you're going to turn left at the first stoplight and go up a hill. At the top of the hill, you're going to pass a great big stone building on your right. Put your guards up. I'm not kidding about this. Halfway through my morning, I got a text message from David. Was there a TB ward at this hospital you keep telling me about? Yep. It was called the Pollock Hospital. Thought so. I picked up a hitchhiker. Later, over lunch, David told me the whole story. He had been driving up Pfeiffer Road and was just passing the Bowen when he felt a heavy tightness in his chest. Then he became aware of someone sitting in the passenger seat of his truck. It was a lanky guy dressed in working man's clothes. You know how you can tell an old farmer by his hands? Their hands are big, calloused, with swollen knuckles from a lifetime of work. I could tell this had been a big guy, but he'd gotten sick later in life. David said, Um, hello there. My name's David. What's yours? George, came the reply. What's the problem, George? 
I've got TB. Given the sympathetic tightness in his chest, David had been expecting that answer. When did you die? This question didn't get an answer. The shade in David's passenger seat was silent. David figured that either George didn't know he was dead, or he didn't feel like discussing it. He tried another question. You're not coming home with me, are you? No, this is my home. So, why are you in my car? An ethereal shrug. I don't get out much. David gave a mental snort. Wait, what? You're an incorporeal being. What do you mean, you don't get out much? But David's a nice guy, and he didn't object to George riding along with him. The Alpha Park Library is still technically on the grounds of the old asylum, so George wasn't going off of the grounds without a pass or anything like that. David did his library visit, although he told me he felt a little funny about it. As he talked with the librarian, he kept casting surreptitious glances over his shoulder, trying to make sure George didn't wander too far away. He didn't want to leave the guy behind. After leaving the library, David and George rode all the way back down Pfeiffer Road together. At the bottom of the hill, George said, Well, thanks for putting up with me. Then he vanished from the passenger seat. He was very cordial, David said. He was one of the most pleasant, well-behaved spirits I've ever encountered. Well, fractured spirits haunting at the Peoria State Hospital, Sylvia brings the passion for the paranormal investigation to her adventures at this haunted hotspot. The spirits come to life once more as she explores their former home. A true ghost story over a hundred years in the making. Fractured Spirits is a narrative of nonfiction at its finest. And you can have this book today. Here is what Audible has set up for us. They are offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This includes free access to the Audible Plus catalog, which is updated monthly with new titles. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you can get Fractured Spirit today. Thank you, Audible, and Sylvia, thank you. Oh, Ron, it was my pleasure. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. Well, this time on These Are Your Stories, we're going to do something a little bit different. Something that I've actually never done on These Are Your Stories, and that is... I'm going to bring in Sylvia Schultz. We just heard her tell us all about an audiobook. Let's see if she's got any stories for us today. Hey, Sylvia. Hey, Ron. How you doing? I'm doing great. It has been a long time since you've been on the show. I don't even know how long it's been. It has been a hot minute, yeah. We have had problems. You've had problems. You went to England. Yes, I've been very busy. Well, you've been all over the world then. <laughs> no, just my beloved England, and I got out to Scotland as well. Do you have time for us little people here on Ron's Amazing <laughs> Stories? <laughs> of course, always, always. So what I thought I'd do, just, just to kind of start things off, is we are going to do a Ghost Stories with Sylvia very soon, and I'm going to say for sure in the month of October. There's no way we can't do the, the month of spooky without a Ghost Stories with Sylvia. But this is not going to be it. This is These Are Your Stories. So maybe we should get to one right away just so we keep the feel of what it's all about. Oh, let's do it. Just jump in, both feet. You ready? Yeah. Well, this... This story comes from Benedict Hilmar. He lives in Winterhude, Hamburg, Germany. Mm. And here's the thing that I think he did. I think he wrote this story in German and then used Google Translate and sent it to me. Well, okay. I'm pretty sure that's what he did. 
because when I got it, I went, wow, I can't read this. Oh, no. <laughs> so what I did was I took it and I basically rewrote it. I rewrote it. Okay. And I really think I captured with what he had intended. Because it wasn't oh, that bad, but you know how Google Translate works. And yeah. so it it was it was sketchy. But I'm pretty mm. sure I've got the gist of it. So do you want to hear Benedict's story? I would love to hear Benedict's story. Now, normally I have a title for these types of stories. You know, they usually send me something. Yeah. I don't have a title. So what I'm going to ask you, Sylvia, is after we're all done, I want you to come up with a title for this story. Ooh, okay. Challenge accepted. Okay. So here we go. This is translated by me from what Benedict sent me. Here we go. This happened not too long ago. My family and I like to get together and party. On this night, we visited my cousin who shared his backyard with my uncle. We got together and had a couple of drinks. About 1 a.m., a little tipsy, I excused myself to use the restroom. I was lazy, so I jumped the little fence and walked into my uncle's home. When I got inside the house, I saw people crying. Confused and a little drunk, I ignored it and opened the comfort room door. Now, I'm assuming that's the bathroom? I should think, yes. Yeah. As I did, my uncle came walking out. I immediately apologized and bowed to show respect. Mm. When I saw his face, it looked a little odd. My uncle is a jolly person, but his face right then looked serious and showed no emotion. Mm. He never looked at me and just walked outside. I just thought he was not in the mood and maybe even a little mad at me, so I proceeded to to do my business. When I got out, I decided to go visit my family in Das Wozimmer. Editor's note, I think that means living room. Mm. I overheard that my uncle passed away that night due to a heart attack. I froze and chills ran up and down my body. Mm. The man I saw a minute ago was not even alive. I never said anything to my relatives. I feel like they would have been more spooked than I was. There you have it. Mm. So what do you think of that story? Wow. That's, <laughs> that is interesting. That's, that's a really good example of a, a crisis apparition. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what that is, so you'll have to... A crisis oh, apparition? A, a crisis apparition is a ghost that appears to someone either as they are dying, as the, the, the person is dying, he appears to, he or she appears to a witness, or if they, they don't have to, and most of them are people who are in the business of dying, but sometimes it's just a really intense emotional moment that's not as common. But yeah, that's what it sounds like is this fellow, this, this Benedict, saw his uncle as a crisis apparition ghost. Hmm. Because it, and that's, that's another hallmark of this situation is that the witness has no idea that there's anything wrong. It's just, oh, hey, this, this person's here. They're supposed to be in another country or whatever. Um, but they, they, they think that they are looking at their loved one or their friend or their sibling or whatever. So, yeah, that's, that's what I think happened. Hmm. And then Benedict found out later that his uncle had passed. Well, I tell you, I can say I've never had a story quite like that one on These Are Your Stories before. It is yeah. quite unique. Yeah. And, and he said his face looked a little odd and that he was serious and didn't show any emotion. So that kind of ties in with what you're saying. Yeah, that's that's a hallmark of it, too, usually, is that the person doesn't react or maybe interacts just very, very superficially, just a, a quick greeting, if they even greet the person at all. 
but usually it's there's there's something off and it's usually that they're very solemn and very serious well they're they're going through a big change Mm -hmm. so they're not in a joking mood (laughs) obviously not yeah so i don't know it's a crazy story and i hope and benedict i hope i got the translation right i'm pretty sure i did yeah benedict i'm sorry for your loss and and um it was nice that you got to see your uncle one more time i'm sorry it was under such circumstances (laughs) Gosh. Yeah. So I guess I would like to say, Benedict, if you want to give us any informa- any more information, I'd like to hear, you know, what happened after that. And probably nothing did. Yeah. All right. So what title would you give this story? <laughs> oh, gosh. I'm usually fairly rubbish at titles, but I would give it something like... um who, who came to the party or something like that? How about we call it Das Wodzimmer? Ooh, what does that mean? It, well, like I said in the story, I think it means living room. <laughs> we could call it that, sure. <laughs> and uh, let it go at that. Yeah, let's do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, Sylvia, so tell us about what you've been doing. I mentioned that you were in England. What else has been going on? I have a little bird tell me that there might be a new book. Well, there is indeed word on the street that there is a new Sylvia Schultz book out <laughs> in the world. <laughs> what's its title and what's it about? Oh, boy. This is called Gone on Vacation, Haunted Zoos, Museums, and Amusement Parks. Oh, that sounds great. Oh, boy. People are really excited about it. Um, I, I'm... I'm getting so much good feedback from it. And that just makes me so happy because this book was a labor of love. I have been backburnering this poor thing for so long, but I really, really wanted to write it because this is a love story for my nine-year-old self uh, who loved zoos and museums and amusement parks and was terrified of ghosts but was interested in them anyway. And yeah, I this this is the book that I have always wanted to write, as it turns out. Hmm. So is it available now? Is it something we can go get right as we speak? It sure is. Yeah, it's, it's on Amazon, of course. It is also available through a place called bookshop.org. Oh, yeah. We've talked about that before. We have. Yeah. When you make a purchase from bookshop.org, A part of your purchase price goes into a fund, and every month that fund gets divvied up between the proprietors of independent bookstores. Oh, nice. So it's a really great way to support local businesses. Well, that sounds great. And so uh, we can go get it right now. You sure can. All right. There's also actually a new Days of the Dead calendar out. Oh, that's it's that time of year, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. SylviaSchultz.wordpress.com is where you can contact me to get your muddy paws on something like that. I'll tell you a little bit about it. I have one that is finishing up here. Mm. And basically what it is, is you it's a calendar, fully functional, place to write your appointments or whatever you want to remember when your um, Netflix expires, whatever you want to write in there. And then... You get a ghost story every single month. (laughs) And so it's a great little addition to my wall. I'm actually looking at it right now. Fantastic. So that's a a good thing. So we get that where one more time? SylviaSchultz.wordpress.com Well, Sylvia, I want to ask you for a favor. What's that? Well, there's another book you did. It's called The Days of the Dead. We talked a little bit about it before. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you would read to us the story from September 26th, um, I believe, 1880. That is correct. Yes. Could you read us that story to close us out on this? I certainly will. The story for September 26th is called The Hero Engineer. It comes from Sacramento, California in 1880. 
Of such things are heroes made. Railroad engineer William Brown made the ultimate sacrifice on September 26, 1880, dying so that hundreds of lives would be saved. Someone had thrown the wrong switch, and Brown found his train headed onto a ferry wharf that led directly into San Francisco Bay. Thinking quickly, Brown managed to unhitch the passenger cars from his locomotive. The cars slid to a stop, but the engine plunged into the water. When the locomotive was pulled from the bay, salvagers were astounded to see Brown still grasping the controls, still trying to bring the engine to a stop. Brown is now said to haunt the old city cemetery in Sacramento. That is a great story. You know, and it's funny, I've never heard it before, and it seems like that would be the stuff of folklore. Yeah, yeah. That is what it's like to have the book, The Day of the Dead. The calendar gives you a story every month. This book gives you a story every day of the year. That's right. And it is great. I have a, I have a copy of it right here in front of me, and I love this thing. This is a great book. Well, thank you. All right, Sylvia. So tell us one more time as we end this, where can we find everything there is to know about Sylvia Schultz? You can find everything there is to know at sylviaschultz.wordpress.com. That is the, the place for all of my information. That is the place to find out more about the Days of the Dead calendars. It's a place to find out more about Gone on Vacation. And it has the landing site for episodes of Lights Out, of which half a dozen, the next half a dozen or so, will be stories that I have collected in England. Oh, that's going to be great. Oh, yeah. All right, Sylvia. Well, I want to thank you for doing the audiobook with us today, reviewing Fractured Spirits. And I want to thank you for taking the time and being part of These Are Your Stories. It was my pleasure, Ron. See you next on Ghost Stories with Sylvia. I'll be there. Well, that's it for this time. If you have a story that you would like to share, head to the main website at ronsamazingstories.com. Click on the story submission banner, leave your story, give it a title, and please tell me where you're from. I'll read it if I can. Our featured story for this time comes from one of my favorite horror series, Inner Sanctum. They had tales of mystery, terror, suspense, and of course, its tongue-in-cheek introductions. The program's familiar and famed audio trademark was an eerie creaking door which opened and closed the broadcasts. All in all, this one had it all going on. The stories were fantastic and always brought chills to my bones with every broadcast. In fact, I can't say that I've ever heard a single bad episode. My only gripe is there aren't more of them. Our story today is no exception. A woman faces the ghost of her dead husband that she may or may not have had a hand in his demise. It is titled The Listener, and it first aired on July 20th, 1950. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum for another visit with your favorite character. We're back again with a familiar subject, murder. Ever want to find out how scared you can get? Hmm. Well, suppose you hang around for a while, and when the show's over, I'll cut you down. <laughs> All right. 
Suppose we get down to brass tacks. And I do mean the ones that go around the edge of a coffin. In a tiny cottage lost in a wild, desolate section of rural New England, Ellen Richards sits in a chair, listening. Approaching 60, white-haired, with eyes that dance nervously in the firelight, she listens. She hears the winds weeping and moaning, grim heralds of the bleak winter. But she listens. Tell him to come home at once. Number, please. My nephew, Leslie, I told you. What's the matter with you? Don't you understand? You must hurry. I beg your pardon. What number do you wish to call? Number? Number? Oh, he's in town somewhere. The depot. Call him at the depot. Oh, don't you understand? I hear the boots. So heavy. Hard little boots. And the cane tapping. It's my husband. He's coming up out of the cellar step by step. And he's been dead for five years. And now, he's on the landing. And now he's opening the door. And now... Oh! 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 Hello, Andy. Oh, Leslie, you darling, darling boy. Oh, it's you. It's you. And not the other. Really, Andy, I don't quite understand. You dear boy, you must forgive me. I'm hysterical. Just be patient with me. I'll be all right in a minute. What's wrong? What happened? Let me hold your hand. Oh, just... Knowing that you're here makes me feel better already. I thought I'd go out of my mind. Oh, you poor mm. darling. Now, if you'll only tell me oh, what... Wait I... a moment. Do you hear anything? Just the wind? That's all? That's all. Oh, Leslie, you mustn't leave me alone ever again. I simply can't bear to be alone. But I just drove to the station to get Miss Morrow. Darling, you're in a terrible state. You really must sit down. I'll get you... No, no, no. I'll be all right, child. Be all right. Where's Miss Morrow now? She went through the side entrance in her room, I guess. I think I'm going to discharge that girl. Why? Oh, I don't know. I feel she doesn't belong here. I don't like strangers about her. Really, Auntie, you're being silly. You can't bear being alone, and now you want to discharge your companion. Well, you're here now. But I can't be with you all the time. Leslie. But you almost never leave the house, and someone must go out to get things done once in a while. Oh. Oh, yes, I suppose you're right. And it won't do you a bit of harm to go out once in a while, too. The movies in town, or maybe New York for the theater. No, no, no. But, Ellen. Don't you dare suggest that again. You must never suggest that again, do you hear? But why? Why must you stay here locked up in this house? Because... Because ever since my husband disappeared, I vowed... Oh, what the you she wouldn't understand. I think I would. Oh, no, no. You're young and handsome and charming, and there's no use troubling you with all that. There. I feel ever so much better already. No, oh, dear Leslie, you don't know what you've done for me. Really? It was horrible living here with just Miss Morrow until... You were sweet enough to come and stay with a poor, lonely old lady. I know it must be trying for you. It's really lots of fun. I'm having a fine time. And that talk of your being an old lady is just nonsense. Why, if Uncle Gregory were here and could see you now, he'd fall in love and marry you all over again. Why do you say that? Just to make you laugh. Oh. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're very flattering. <laughs> See, you're laughing. That's better. Leslie, you you won't go away ever, will you? What an idea. You're my only living relative. I'll remember your kindness when I'm gone. You'll be wealthy, very wealthy. Here, now, what kind of talk is this when you're gone indeed? Why, we're going to have grand times here forever and ever. Now, you go to bed and 
sleep away all that foolishness. And here's a kiss for a pleasant dream. Mm. <laughs> oh, you silly, silly boy. <laughs> well, say goodnight to Miss Morrow for me. I'm too tired to wait. Good night. Barbara? Come in. Barbara. Don't tell me about it. Don't say anything. Just just kiss me and hold me tight. Oh, dear. Oh, oh Leslie. I could hardly bring myself to come back here tonight. She's so hateful and cruel. Barbara, don't. She may hear you. I'm sorry, but how much more of this do you think I can stand? This house will drive me as mad as she is. Please, dearest. All right, all right. It all seems so senseless. You say you love me and yet... You know I haven't any money, but I'll get some. I'll get a great deal, and as soon as I do... What I want to know is when. When? Tonight. Perhaps. the only one. What is it? It's Gregory. Oh, no, Annie. I know it. That's the way he used to walk around the house, chatting with his kids. No, that's not. But I know. I heard it before while I was alone. He's come back somehow. Oh, Leslie, he's come back. Then why should he do this? If it's Uncle Gregory come back, why, he'd come right in the front door. But don't you see? He can't. He's been dead these five years. He told me he disappeared. I know. I know. I I didn't want to shock you. I Oh, Leslie. How much can I trust you? Trust me? Why, Auntie, you know there isn't anything I wouldn't do for you. Anna, listen. Where is it coming from? The living room. Give me my robe. Yeah. But I don't see why you must get out of bed. I must know about this. I can't leave this house, Leslie, and if he's here... Why can't you leave it? You can sell it and go away. You don't understand. Yes, the living room. We're going in there. I'm not afraid to face anything if you're with me. Now, come. Very well. Do you see anything? There's nothing in the corridor. But I can hear it. It's closer. There's the living room. Not a soul there. Oh. Why'd you pick up that fireplace iron? You'll know in a moment. Can you move the piano? These old uprights are pretty heavy, but I think I can do it. There. Get that little shovel from the fireplace. Hurry! I say, I don't understand. What are you doing there? What is it? Some kind of secret trap door in the floor you're trying to move with that iron? Yes. It's the floor. Of all. Oh, here, let me do it. All right. I think I have it now. There's nothing but dirt under there. Use the shovel. Very well. Leslie, I don't know. Listen. The tapping is stopped. Yes. Why? Perhaps this is why. Perhaps he wanted me to find his body. He's still there? Look. Gregory! So that's why you never left this house, isn't it? He was lying here all this time. Lying here where you buried him. After you murdered him. Isn't that so? Now, who was bleeding last? Oh, yes. Auntie Ellen, the old darling, just had her nephew dig up her husband from under the floor. If you think she kept him there to make him stay home night, you're wrong. He'd been murdered. And Auntie Ellen's nephew just accused her of killing him. Yes. Yes, I killed him. Leslie, you mustn't tell anybody. I know you won't tell. 
Oh, it's been horrible living all these years with him right in the same house. I could never leave someone might find him, you see. And every time I heard a noise in the house, oh, it was frightful. I should think so. That's why I sent for you. I couldn't bear it alone. Now you know my secret, and you will help me. Will I? Of course, dear Leslie. I know you will, and... Won't you? Oh, it's Miss Morrow. Don't get her through. Quite all right, Auntie Ellen. Come in, Barbara. No, no, you can't. I've heard everything, Mrs. Richards. And I know everything. You know? You and Leslie. It was you who made those noises, that tapping. It didn't start until after you came. Yes, Auntie Ellen. You horrid boy. Why did you? How could you do this to me after everything I've done for you? I I thought you loved me. I thought... Sit down. No, I I will not. Sit down, I said. Barbara. Get a checkbook. Okay. What are you going to do? Dear Aunt Ellen, you are going to write a check for $50,000. For you? For me. The book and the pen. I see it all now. What a fool I've been, taking the two of you into my home. And now you do this to me just to get my money. You killed him for that money. You have no right to talk. You made him do this. Leslie's a good boy. You found out about this and you put him up to it. I'm going to call the police. You're a little thief. You are a murderer, Auntie Ellen. You won't call any police. In fact, you'll tell no one. And you'll write that check now. You understand? Leslie? Yes. You're quite right. I'm not in a very good position, am I? You hurt me deeply, Leslie. After I trusted you, after I... Leslie, what happened to her? What's the matter? Uh, I don't know. She just stood up and collapsed. Addie. Addie Ellen. Is she dead? No, she's still breathing. But she's paralyzed, stiff as a board. Father, call a doctor. I'll fix that floor and push the piano back. You think it's safe? Absolutely. She won't say a word if she comes out of it. And if she does tell about the check, who will believe her? It'll be our word against a murderer. Come on, Barbara. We've got to get her well enough to write that check. Mrs. Richards, if you can understand what I'm saying, blink your eyes. Ah, thank you. Well, Dr. Walsh? Well, I can't give you a final opinion yet, young man. She seems to know what we're saying. Was it a stroke? Possibly. We won't know until I can take some x-rays. It may be simple hysterical paralysis. Doctor, uh, I'd I'd like to know if if there's any danger. Danger? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Patients have sometimes lived for years after a stroke. I'm going to call in a specialist for consultation. And uh, I'll be back in the morning with x-ray equipment. Uh, Meanwhile, don't move her from that chair. Yes, Dr. Walsh. It was very kind of you to come so quickly. Mrs. Richards is an old friend of mine. Call me at once if she seems to get worse. I certainly will. Good night. Good night. Leslie. Oh, rotten luck, isn't it? Just when we had... Hello. She seems to be smiling. Be careful. She can understand everything you say. I know. And let her. Let her. You won't get away with it, Auntie. We still have you, you know. The will. You forgot about that will. You can't make a new one now. You can't write. And we know your secret. Yes, Auntie. We still have you. No, Leslie. She has us. What are you talking about? You heard what the doctor said. It may be years. We can wait. Can we? Wait here, taking care of her, waiting for her to die? You imagine what that'll be like? Well, maybe you can wait. I can't. Barbara, you must What's the use, Leslie? We waited all this time, and you see what happened? We're worse off than we were before. Now, Barbara, you mustn't lose your head. There may be something we can do. What can we do? We can... Yes, Leslie? She got away with it. Why can't we? Murder. Yes. I've even thought of a plan. 
have you? We can both be away, far away from here in South America, perhaps, when this house can catch fire. An invalid, unable to move, it can be arranged, you know. Yes, yes, it can be arranged. But are you sure of this will? Certainly, she told me about it a dozen times. Have you seen it? No, but I know. You can't believe what she tells you. You better look. You must be sure of all this. You're quite right. I'm almost certain the will is in her room. I'll find it. You'll see that I'm right. Did you say something, Mrs. Richards? I thought I heard you say something. Why are you looking at me that way? Mrs. Richards, I'm not afraid. I don't care if you heard everything. I'm not afraid of you anymore. You and your orders. Nothing I did was ever good enough for you, was it? Always telling me I was too common, too cheap for you. Well, I found out what you were tonight. Stop your staring at me. You want to know something, Mrs. Richards? He didn't figure this out himself. I was the one who was smart enough for that. I kept wondering why you never left this house. Why your husband disappeared. And I told Leslie. You stop your staring at me! Barbara, what is it? I heard you scream. I... I... It's nothing. It's nothing at all. Have you found it? No, not yet, but it's around somewhere. I'm sure of it. Do you want it? No. No. I'll find it in a minute, I'm sure. This is Richard. The chair. The chair has moved. You moved it while my back was turned while I was talking to Leslie, didn't you? Didn't you? The andirons from the fireplace. There, a minute ago. Did you take it? Did you? Didn't you enough to rip. No! Don't! Don't! <laughs> I found it. She left me everything. Barbara, what happened to you? Andy Ellen, where are you? I'm standing behind you, Leslie. What? Don't move. But Barbara... She's dead. I killed her. I have the andiron here in my hand. Don't move. Andy, now please. Stay on your knees. Just where you are. Very well. If you wish. But... You were very anxious to find out what happened to my husband. Now you shall know everything. In fact, you shall know precisely because the same thing is going to happen to you. You see, I use this very same instrument, this poker. You and she will share his grave. It's an awesome, silly joke, isn't it? You, you can't do this to me. You know that I love you. Don't move. But don't you see, Andy? Sake, put that thing down. You don't know what you're doing. Don't. don't. Hello. I'm sorry to disturb you, Dr. Walsh. This is Ellen Richards. Ellen Richards? <laughs> I knew you'd be surprised, but I fully recovered. You were quite right when you thought it was hysterical paralysis. Well, I thought so all along, but uh, naturally I wouldn't venture an opinion without an expert. But uh, why did it happen? Oh, it was a silly thing, I suppose, but my nephew Leslie told me he was going to marry Miss Morrow. In fact, they planned to elope. And uh, that was the shock that brought it on? Yes, Dr. Walsh. I, I suppose I let myself care for my nephew more than I should. Yes, yes, I understand. But I'm quite over it now. I sent them on with my blessing. They drove into New York, and they're sailing for South America in a few days. So you needn't come tomorrow evening. All right, Ellen. But your nerves must be in bad shape. You better let me give you a checkup. Very well, Doctor. I'll come to your house the day after tomorrow. Good night. Good night. There, Ellen, that completes my checkup. And what's the verdict? <laughs> You've got a constitution like iron. <laughs> You'll live to at least 110. Oh, but, Ellen, you have to get out of your house. No, now, don't go into that again, Dr. Walsh. When Gregory disappeared, I made up my mind I would never leave, and I mean to stick to that vow. That's not what I meant, Ellen. Haven't you heard the news? What news? 
The new superhighway. It's going to be built right through your property. Uh, your house is dead center of the roadway. They'll have to rip it down. What? Well, they can't do it. I won't let them. Well, there's no reason to be alarmed. You realize a handsome profit for your property. When will these people be around? When are they coming? Why, the surveyors are in the neighborhood now. They may be calling at your house today uh, to examine the property and make an estimate of its value. Today? Well, I, I must get back to the house immediately. I, I don't want them to come when I'm not there. Well, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Hello. Yes. Yes, one moment. It's for you, Ellen. For me? Who is it? Why, I believe the man said the state police. But what could they possibly want with you, Ellen? Auntie Ellen's relatives and friends are now all stone cold dead in the parlor. She bashes nobody's head but her husband's, her nephews, and his girlfriend. <laughs> and we leave this electric personality while she's on her way to becoming a short circuit. <laughs> of course, we don't want to alarm you, but uh, crimes like these don't happen except to people like you and you. But not you. Well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time, when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, won't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. That wouldn't keep you going. I was transfixed by the story, the acting, and even Raymond himself. Truly a classic and a good representative episode. The Inner Sanctum, or simply Inner Sanctum, was hugely popular, and it aired from January 7, 1941 to October 5, 1952. In all, 526 episodes were broadcast. It was created by producer Hyman Brown and was based on the mystery novels of Simon & Schuster. In 1930, they published the first Inner Sanctum mystery, I Am Jonathan Scriber, by Claude Hoddington. And if that wasn't enough, there were several movies made under the brand name. They included Calling Dr. Death, Weird Women, Dead Man's Eyes, The Frozen Ghost, Strange Confession, and The Pillow of Death. All of these were made in the mid-1940s and can be found on imdb.com, the Internet Movie Database. I hope you enjoyed today's story. That was episode number 609, and today I want to thank Benedict Hilmar and, of course, our very own Sylvia Schultz for being on the show today. You both are the best. Thank you. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find any of the links I mentioned and how to contact us. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. Clicking that follow or like button helps us grow. Thank you for listening and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.